And so then you kind of scroll through and you find the photo that you want it to identify. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. And the important thing is if you're using that photo feature, even if your photo is, the bird is super tiny, uh, you want to do whatever you can to zoom it in as much as possible and get as much of that bird in that square to make it work. A lot of people think, oh, I shouldn't zoom in, but you definitely want to uh, zoom it in as much as possible. And I know the, the team that works on this, and they were telling me one day that they had, when they were working on this early on, they're like, oh, we have this whole list of species that we really need people to contribute to make the algorithm work. And I was like, I have all those species, but the photos are terrible. And they're like, we want the terrible photos because that helps us improve the identification because most people submit really bad photos. So anyway, if you have bad photos of birds, Merlin can really use it. You're helping AI intelligence. All right, are there any other questions before I move to the next app? Did that monocular right. come with that camera? That just comes how, we, how it is? That's it. Yes, that monocular, that's how it comes. And uh, so the camera is built into it. Um, and I think this is just the tip of the iceberg technology wise. I think eventually we'll get actual binoculars that will be able to identify uh, birds for us. And it's not out of the realm of possibility for these things to start doing things like and identifying trees, identifying dragonflies, identifying butterflies. This thing is just, this is what's coming. In the next 10 years, we'll have binoculars that we can't even imagine what they can do. They'll probably tell us where the birds are. Who, made, who makes that monocular? Swarovski Optic. And a lot of people are familiar with Swarovski because of the crystals, but Swarovski also makes really high-end binoculars and spotting scopes. Uh, and in the birding world, the best binoculars you can get is either one of the European brands like a Zeiss or Swarovski. There are a lot of other brands that are really good like Nikon and Vortex, but those are kind of the top top tier end of binoculars. Could, could you spell that please? Swarovski? Yes. Um, actually, I think, is it, no, they just have the hawk. Okay, is it, is it written out? Oh, can you hand me my scope? Here, I'll take it off of here. I guess it's backwards. Oh, wait, they can't see it because I'm sharing screen. Stop share. It's spelled S W A R O V S K I. Great, thank you. They're Austrian. All right. I'll ask for one more question and then I'm going to move on to another really cool app. Hi, Ranger. My name's Kim and I'd like to know if we're going to do sound identification. Oh, Kim, that is a fantastic question. Um, I could do a whole separate program on that. Sound identification is really challenging. Uh, I, a big question I get is why isn't there a Shazam app or a Siri version for me to just hold up my phone and identify birds for me? And there's two reasons why not. Uh, number one is that uh, like with Shazam, you were in a store and you heard a song and there's just one song playing. How often is there just one bird singing outside? And most of the time the birds that we want to identify, it's that really kind of quiet, buzzy thing in the top of the oak tree. Meanwhile, a house wren is singing its full head off 10 feet away from us. So the phone's going to gravitate towards that. Gotcha. The other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that birds have accents. So a cardinal in Minnesota sounds quite different than a cardinal in Florida. You know, they talk a lot slower up here. Yeah. Um, but so those are some challenges. That's not to say that people aren't working on it. Uh, there's a, a device called Chirp Tracker, which tries really hard to identify and it identifies about 30 of the most common species out there. And it's about 75% accurate, I would say. There's another device called Bird Genie and it will try to identify 30 of the most common species of birds out there, some species of frogs, and if you try to fool it with human sounds, it'll even say, yep, eh, this is a human. Um, the one thing that I do like about Bird Genie versus Chirp Tracker is that it shows you the sonogram of the bird call, and some people have a much easier time seeing that sonogram, because each bird, even if it sounds the same to us, the sonogram is going to be different. 
Um, but there is a new uh, a new app being worked on by Cornell Lab of Ornithology called BirdNet. And that's supposed to be really accurate, but it's not where it could be. But I'd encourage you, if that is something you'd want to check out or learn more about, is check out BirdNet. I think we're about five, three to five years away from a really good app helping us identify bird calls. Now, if you want to try and learn your bird calls, there's a really great website called LarkWire. And it uses, and it can be an app too, it uses a series of games to teach you the bird calls. So you can kind of say, I really need to work on my warblers. I'm really terrible about warblers in May. And it'll give you a warbler game and it'll play a warbler call and it'll show four warblers and you have to tap which warbler you think it is. And it figures out really quickly which warblers you're terrible at and it kind of incorporates them more into the game. And I like that as a learning tool because you're also getting the visual stimulation that you need to associate it with those songs. So we're not quite where we need to be with identifying bird calls, but we're getting there. What was that app called? The one that teaches you, that's called yeah. LarkWire. And the new app LarkWire. for learning and recording bird calls is called BirdNet. All right, are we ready to go to the next app? I'm gonna keep this quick. Okay, share screen. Share. Okay, cool. There's the Cooper's Hawk. Let's get to, okay. Oops. Okay, so another app that I want to talk about is eBird. And uh, eBird is free, but to really get the full features from it, you have to have an account. It's free to have an account. You don't get too much spam. It's not like any of the Audubon apps, um, but it's, it's based with Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And what this is, it's primarily an app to uh, get you to document birds that you see, whether it's in your backyard or whether you're like me and going bike riding on the Gateway Trail and you wanna kind of do some point counts as you're biking and birding. Um, but it's, it's just a way to report birds. But if you have an eBird account, you can, uh, if you look at the bottom of the screen down there where it says explore, this intimidating jumble of blue and red spots lets you know uh, where birds are being reported recently. And because this is the Twin Cities metro area, there's a ton of dots. Blue dots are personal places. Like for example, one of these blue dots is my backyard. And so that's just telling you where birds are being seen. The red dots are what are known as hot spots, And those are usually public places that uh, people like to go. And so you can kind of look nearby to where you live and it's like, Oh, look here in Falcon Heights, there's a couple of red dots. I wanna go birding. And uh, one of those, those red dots is Reservoir Woods. And if you look down there at the bottom, it says 159 all time. That means 159 species of birds have been seen there since reporting has been happening. Uh, it also gives you uh, what you're likely to see this time of year. So there are at least 63 species you could see right now if you went birding there. And then it says in the last seven days, people have been birding there and reporting uh, what they've seen to eat. Bird. And so 54 species have been seen. And so you can go in and you can explore that and see if that's someplace that you want to go. And then it tells you, it'll show you what's been seen in the last few days. Holy cow, a cackling goose. I'm going to have to go for that tomorrow. Sorry, ignore me. <laughs> so, uh, so it, and it also, if you see these charts that are with them, it that gives you a sense of how often they're reported. So if you look at red-bellied woodpecker, which has a whole bunch of dark blue bars in it, that's a pretty common bird you can see at any time. But if you look down at Eastern Phoebe, it doesn't have as many blue dots. That just means like it can only be seen there certain times of year. And it, if you know your birds at all, blue jays, crows, chickadees, they're fairly common. So it makes sense that they're seen there a lot. Well, hey, now this is interesting. Somebody had a tufted titmouse there. That's a really good bird for Reservoir Woods. I maybe shouldn't have opened up Reservoir Woods since that's my patch because now I'm thinking I have to go hit that tomorrow and get some of these birds. But that's what I like about eBird is it, it helps you uh, look up different species of birds and figure out uh, where you wanna go birding maybe the next day. But the really important thing that you can do with eBird is that you can submit your bird sightings. And even if you're not a great birder, 
order, it doesn't matter. It's really important data. And oftentimes we have really great birds in our backyard that aren't understood very well. So if you can report these birds, that, that makes it even better. And I'll just to kind of give you an ID, idea. When you hit, click, oh, when you click submit, it'll ask you for a date and time and it usually defaults to whatever it is when you enter it in. But let's say, what's a bird that we've had around here lately? So I just brought up pine siskin because quite a few pine siskins have been showing up. And if you don't know what a pine siskin is, if you go into Merlin, it'll identify it for you. But you notice it has like, a, it had a little dot next to it and it says it's underreported. That means a lot of people haven't been reporting it. And according to all the field guide maps that are out there, it should be being reported in your area. And so it's just kind of a really fun and easy way to contribute to citizen science. They have specific days for eBird, like we just had this past weekend, Global Big Day, where they encourage people from all over the world to use eBird for a day. And I just saw like the initial reports of that. There are roughly 10,000 species of birds that can be seen all over the planet. And uh, preliminary reports have that everybody that participated in the latest global big day was 7,000 birds, which I think is pretty exciting <laughs> that we got that close to the 10,000 bird list. So, uh, and just reporting stuff in your backyard is a great way to do it. Uh, I happened to report was the bird I got, Fox Sparrow for my team. And that ended up being a really good bird for global big day. And that's a bird that quite a few of us will have in our backyards right now. Are there any questions about eBird? So really handy app that's free that will help you find birds. It'll even give you dry directions to a lot of these hotspots. So like if you looked at Reservoir Woods and you had eBird open, you're like, I'd like to go there. I don't know how to get there. I don't know where parking is. If you click on Reservoir Woods and you click on directions, it will give you driving directions to the parking spots. All right, if there aren't any questions, I'm going to very slowly share a different screen just in case someone does have questions and wrap this up by showing another thing you can do with phones. So I've talked about two apps, one for identification, one for finding birds. But the other thing that you can do with your smartphone is you can take pictures. And you, I encourage people all the time, even people who don't have the equipment that I do, that if you hear a bird and you don't know what it is, please take a video of it. Because even if I can hear it, I can help you identify it. A lot of the websites out there that will identify things for you, if you can take a video of it, that works great. Always take a video if you don't know what a sound is because the microphone for video is a lot stronger than it is for voice memo. If you use voice memo, it uses the microphone at the bottom of your phone. And that's great if you're someone from public radio interviewing someone, you wanna have a nice sedate conversation about how they feel about the current political situation. But if you wanna hear a bird, use the, uh, use the, the video microphone because it's designed to pick up things at a further distance. But Another thing you can do with your phone and your binoculars or your spotting scope is take videos and uh, pictures. And so I'm gonna hit play here. This is a video that I took up at Zaxxon Bog in Minnesota. Uh, this is me hand holding my phone to my scope. I'm across the street from a tree and there is a great gray owl in the top of that tree. And I'm gonna slowly lower my phone down onto my spotting scope. There'll be a little bit of a handshake because it is three degrees out when I took this uh, video. But I lowered my phone down onto my spotting scope and there is a great gray owl. Then I tapped my phone screen because the phone will autofocus with the scope eyepiece. And there we have a video of a great gray owl. And then here's a still image that I, I took with that. And one of the things that really impressed me with this situation is that the sun had already set at this point. So it was just below the horizon. It was a really low light conditions. And I was able to get this picture of this owl in Northern Minnesota. This was uh, one of my first had my first iPhone when I had a 4S. Um, I was in Israel on a crane watching trip and uh, I don't know if anybody here has ever been to see the cranes in Kearney, Nebraska. They take you out into the blinds first thing at 4.30 a.m. It's completely dark. 
And they tell you no talking, no whispering, no flash photography, no coughing, no sneezing. We'll kick you out of the blind. It's going to scare the cranes. Well, in Israel, the cranes are really used to farm equipment. So they attach bleachers to the back of tractors and they drive you out into the flocks. And they even are on loudspeaker letting you know all the talks about the cranes. And the cranes don't care. So they were driving us around in this tractor uh, with bleachers into these flocks of cranes. It was a beautiful sunrise. It was foggy. I had an SLR, SLR camera. I was trying to take pictures, but because of the jitteriness, my cameras were artistic at best. And uh, I just got in this iPhone and I took this landscape shot. And I was like, wow, if phone can do that. I wonder what would happen if I held my phone up to my spotting scope in this jittery tractor. So I held my phone up to my spotting scope and got this picture. And I was like, I'm never using an SLR ever again. <laughs> And so I've kind of been playing, I play around quite a bit with uh, smartphones and uh, scopes because the scopes can really take a beating outside. I can drop them in snow. I can be in the pouring rain. And when it's pouring rain, I can just fit my phone in a waterproof pocket and everything is good to go. But these are some photos that I've taken with my phone and my spotting scope. I guess I should have warned that this program is PG-13 since these are wood storks mating. Um, the other great thing with phones is that uh, you can really do some fun things with the autofocus and auto exposure. This, I had my phone attached to my scope and I uh, had selected it to focus on the sunset exposure. So I got the colors of the sunset and then I used my spotting scope to manually focus on the uh, palms down below and then this tricolored heron flew in. So I got this kind of cool silhouette shot. This is a type of night jar called a paraki that you can see in South Texas. I thought this was just a really fat bird. And then when I downloaded photos later, I realized there were two tiny beaks sticking out from underneath her. And this is just a female with two chicks underneath her. If you practice, if you practice hard enough, you can get pictures of warblers. That was a, that was a chestnut sided warbler. This is an orange crowned warbler. Uh, this is an egret, uh, great egret that we get here in Minnesota in its uh, mating display. It's a roseate spoonbill. And it doesn't have to be just still photos. You can have a lot of fun with time lapses. I do a lot with sunrises and moonsets. This is a moon the, that I took. You can just use the time lapse and you set the exposure onto the moon. I had an eclipse party at my old apartment on the roof and I had some friends over to watch the, the lunar eclipse and then everybody in my building came by and they saw me taking pictures. So I had a line of people and I was uh, holding up their smartphones to my spotting scope and getting pictures of the lunar eclipse. And the next day that was all my Instagram feed was pictures that I took for other people. You can also take slow motion video. Uh, I do this all the time. Uh, this is a video that I got in the Rio Grande Valley, Texas at a suet feeder. There's a green jay and a great kiskadee. And it looks like the kiskadee is just smacking against the bird feeder. This is the exact same footage uh, taken with a phone going in at half speed. So there's the green jay eating. You can see the kiskadee is actually hovering to get some of the peanut butter. and the green jay is gonna fly away. This is the bird someone asked me what the green blue bird was. <laughs> you can also use your headphones on a, as a remote shutter, which is handy if you're on a dock and people are walking around you and you wanna try and get a stabilized shot or it's a windy day. Um, basically, you just use whatever headphones come with your phone. You can also buy Bluetooth shutter releases too, super, uh, photos using super cheap on, uh, Amazon. So you can see the the woodpecker and the sparrow there are feeding on the finch feeder and all you do is you hit the volume down button and that's what takes the picture. So that's a handy thing to do there. And then my other favorite thing to do with these is that uh, quite a few apps, one of the apps Apps that comes with the iPhone will turn all your photos and videos into trailers, movie trailers. Uh, you can buy some for the Android. And so I went to the Rio Grande Valley Bird Festival and then uh, got on my flight home and had a gin and tonic and made this. 
Birding is lying for me. I know a lot of people like to say birding is something my grandmother did. And it's like, yeah, this is this is really what it's like. Um, and there are a variety of devices that you can use to attach your spotting scope to your phone or your binoculars. I personally use phone scope quite a bit. Uh, it's a, an iPhone case that you can get and you go to their website. Their, their website looks a little different than this. I really like the screenshots a little bit old. But you choose in the type of phone that you have and you choose in the type of optic, whether it's binocular, spotting scope, or even microscope, and they make a case for you. And uh, it they used to give a discount to, uh, I don't know if that discount's still accurate, but I just really like it because it's easy to get the phone in and out of it. And it's way cheaper than some of the other ones out there. There are some super cheap ones you can get on Amazon that are supposed to work with several different types of phones and several different types of spotting scopes. I find that those uh, are really futzy and the bird flies away before I actually get it to work. Uh, whereas one like phone scope that works with your actual phone and your actual spotting scope is spot on. There are some out there like for instance, Swarovski makes them specifically for their scopes, but I really don't wanna spend $250 on an iPhone case, whereas this is like in the $60 range. And they can take a beating because I drop these all the time. <laughs> Brian is shaking his head yes because he's seen me how many times I've dropped my iPhone. That Apple Care Protection Plan is a lifesaver for me. Um, all right, so I have so many more things that I could talk about, but I kind of want to give people a break from staring at the screen. Uh, but if you have any other questions, I am happy to answer them. What's your best place for birding, favorite of all time? In the United States or Minnesota? Uh, close by, somewhere in the States. Um, so here in Minnesota, uh, what, just general, if, if it's any time of year, the old Cedar Avenue Bridge down at Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge is one of my all time favorite go-to spots. And it's a place I recommend to people quite a bit. It's a really good place to go birding year round. If we wanna get season specific, uh, March through June, I highly recommend Marshall Terrace Park in North Minneapolis because we have the heron rookery there and there's all kinds of other birds. It's a really good park. Um, and then in the wintertime, of course, Saxon Bog is fantastic. You can drive around and get winter finches and great gray owls. But in the United States, like if someone said, hey, you can go anywhere uh, right now uh, for an entire week, We'll pay for everything. It'd be the Rio Grande Valley, Texas, Harlingen, McAllen. As a matter of fact, uh, I may or may not have talked to my boss into letting me telecommute there for a month this winter. <laughs> so, will you spell the Rio the Rio Grande cities that you just said? Oh, sure. So, the Rio Grande Valley is several small towns, and it's near South Padre Island. But the two airports that you can fly into or that the two cities people tend to stay in, one is Harlingen, H-A-R-L-I-N-G-E-N. -E and the other one is McAllen, M-C-C-A-L-L-E-N. And I love those areas because the birding is amazing. You're right along, I hate to say this, but the area that was getting a lot of attention because of the border wall and the kids in cages, that's that area. And it's killed me that that is what they've been in the news for when it's really an amazing wildlife hotspot. The, the people that live in those cities 
that doesn't represent them. I mean, there are a lot of really great locals there who have amazing restaurants and amazing shops and are super excited to show you their birds. Um, but that is a place I would go to every single winter, whether I was booked there for a speaking engagement or if I just had time to go on my own. And they have amazing parks with fantastic trails. And it's also great for bicycling. And uh, it's really good for retirement too, for people that are so inclined. And the Marshall Terrace right Park, is that just M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L? -L? Yes, Marshall Terrace. And it's easy to drive by. It's right next to the Excel plant. Uh, and the park itself has a teeny tiny parking lot. It's very close to Betty Dangers. The best time to really visit that is from June, or I'm sorry, is from uh, kind of mid to late March through June. Uh, I work for the same park that uh, Mr. Goodspeed works for, and I usually do um, a Welcome Back the Herons program at the end of March. This year it got canceled because that's when Shelter in Place hit, but uh, I'm I'm fairly confident that even if a shelter in place order, well, if a COVID order is still happening next spring, we could do the Marshall Terrace Park Welcome Back the Heron Party and still be safely socially distanced and look at great blue herons. They're, they nest on the two islands there. It's the best view of great blue herons. And there's other things like cormorants have moved in, great egrets have moved in. And at the end of March, uh, waterfowl migration has kicked in. And so when I've done programs there the last several years at the end of March, we've had loons and hooded mergansers and, um, oh gosh, common golden eye. It's a, it's a great spot at the end of March, early April. But you don't always need me to describe those. You can also use eBird. That's that's where that's how I find birds or hotspots. I use eBird quite a bit. Like I remember once uh, I had to go to Las Vegas for work, and I used eBird, and it gave me an alert that that uh, there was a bird called a crystal thrasher that I had never reported to eBird, which meant I'd never seen one before. And so I'm looking at the airport, and my crystal oh, that park's only five miles from the airport. And that park is uh, halfway between the airport and my hotel. So uh, I had the, this was back when there were taxis and not Uber. Uh, and I had the taxi driver drive me to the park. And I said, can you wait here about five to 10 minutes? And I just keep the meter running and I will come back. Yeah, sure. And I went out and I got my crystal thrasher and then I went to my hotel. Is there a phone scope case for Android? Yes, yes. There, I'm sure if you called the owner of phone scope, his name is Cheston and said, hey, I have a flip phone. Can you help me figure out how to attach this to my scope? He would try to find a way. But everything that I've talked about is, uh, it works with Android. I tried really hard to make this program work both ways. Also, if anybody has any general birding questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, my, my name is Tim and thank you for the presentation. My question is, is there any relation to what your research has showed you with wasps, dragonflies or butterflies? In other words, how it all coexists with each other. And for example, I've seen a lot of monarchs this summer. I know it's winter now, but I mean, is there any like certain dragonflies I haven't seen before? Is there some scope I can take a picture of like a certain dragonflies I haven't seen before? There, um, so there is, there are dragonfly apps out there. Um, I'm trying to think, that's a different, that's a different presentation. That's, that's my smartphone nature presentation where I talk about the dragonflies. There is an app out there that's very similar to uh, the Merlin app that I talked about, but it's dragonfly specific. And I'm kind of blanking on the exact name. I'm, I'm trying to stall time as I look for it on my phone. But it's, it's from a website called dragonflies.net. Let's see, let's see if I can find it real quick. Oh, hey, I just found it. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Share screen. Thank you. Share. Sorry, you have to endure me. So there is a, an app 
called Dragonfly ID, and it works very similar to uh, Merlin as uh, like one thing it'll do is, okay, I haven't opened the app for a while, so it's having trouble locating where I am, but this is, a, this is an app that I've used before to uh, search for dragonflies that are most commonly nearby me, but it also has a smart search feature where you can put in where you saw the dragonfly, the, the month that you saw it, and you can also enter in colors and it will try and zero in on which species it is. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. I don't want to, you know, stall up anything, but thank you very much. That's fine. We can do phone, an abbreviated smartphone nature program sometime if you want. We can talk about all the tracking apps that are out there. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have a question. I, I bike along the Mississippi mm -hmm. and underneath the bridge, it's the, I think it's the, the 94 bridge. Uh -huh. I hear this bird that sounds exactly like a ringing bell. It's imitating a ringing bell. It also, I also hear the same, I think it's the same bird, of course, imitating a siren, I think they're of uh, uh, ambulance siren, you know? And it's, I, I can't, I never see the bird. I can't see it. It's, it's up in the rafters of the, of the bridge, but it, it, it's there every year. I, I, I bike that path and, and they keep coming back. So it's really cool. And I was wondering what kind of bird that might be. It could be one of two things. It could be a starling because they're mimics and they'll mimic anything. There are also uh, quite a few bridges in the metro area where they put up speakers that make all kinds of sounds that are alarming to pigeons because pigeons congregate in areas and their fecal material can uh, cause damage. There's a bridge over by North Mississippi Regional Park and every time I go by it, I'm like, oh, crap, I just heard a peregrine. And then I realize, oh, man, this is the bridge that has the peregrine. And so, like, they'll play peregrine calls. They'll play northern goshawk calls. And these are raptors that eat pigeons. They'll play barking dogs and sometimes sirens. And it's all on a loop. And it's, it's designed to try and keep pigeons away. So that's what I'm guessing is going on under that particular bridge. I'm almost positive, though, it's a, real, it's a bird, though, because I can, I can trigger it with my bike bell, I'll ring my bike yeah. bell and it'll answer. It'll answer with yeah. the ringing, with its own ringing. So it's pretty cool. If you could, one day, if you could stop under that bridge and turn on the video function on your phone, trigger the bird yeah. and send a recording and then send the recording to birdchick at Gmail, I would love to hear it and I would happily identify it for you. It sounds exactly like a ring, just something ringing a bell. <laughs> it's cool. All right. Yeah, no, I'd seriously, I would love to hear it and identify it for you. Sometimes it's just a matter of like, you're describing it as a bell and I'm thinking of things. It's just, it's kind of like a, a language barrier thing. Like birders speak in a different language. And it's like, oh, they said bell where I, I would have said that sounds like uh, a three waddle bell bird. Okay. It probably is starlings though, like you said. Uh, they were, they were that would be like, my guess. That's our best mimic in the Twin Cities metro area. We really don't have northern mockingbirds here. They try every few years to nest here, but they haven't been as successful as they have been in the southern mm -hmm. United States. All right. Is there aren't any questions? Access, uh, or do you have a list of where you present and where you bird, or bird with groups? Um, normally, I would tell you to go to my website, birdchick.com. Right now, it's just online presentations. Uh, I'm not doing a lot of uh, programs because of the whole COVID thing. Uh, I'm hopeful <laughs> this spring that that will change and I can have programs that are up for people to do. But right now, I'm, I'm just kind of laying low and doing online programs because I, I want to stay healthy. I want to keep people around me healthy. I want businesses to open up about back in but uh, hopefully hopefully things will be better next spring thank you very much your presentation has been wonderful oh thank you thank you if you guys want the the nature one where i talk about tracking apps and the dragonfly apps and things like that you just tell brian <laughs>
Well, thank you so much for having me. And if somebody had a question they were too shy to ask, birdchick at gmail, you send an email and I'll be happy to answer them there.